In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. Amen. Having gathered yesterday evening for the funeral vigil for Chris, the beginning of the funeral liturgy, we come together, we gather in such a large gathering here. I don't think I've seen our church as full as this for a funeral for a, a long while, but all of us in such a great number here this morning coming to be with um, Colette and with Laura and Paul and Nicola and the whole family in this time of sorrow and sadness. And I know the family are very grateful to Father Stephen being able to be here this morning as a good friend of, of the family. All of us united coming to surround Colette and the family with our, with our presence, with our, our love, with our, our prayers. And above all, what we come to do is to pray for Chris. We come to commend him to God, asking God to take him to himself and to welcome him into that promised kingdom of, of heaven. And there is that need to just to be asking God to reinforce our hope in the mystery of life after death, to help us to believe more and more in the mystery of, of eternal life. We are, are still in the days of the holy season of Lent, a season which invites us to become more focused on God, to, be, to meditate more on the, the mystery and in the person of Christ. And Christ is our hope. Above all, it's why we gather here this morning in this parish church of, of St Andrew with our hope in Christ and with our belief in the, in the mystery of resurrection. So as we gather to offer this Mass, coming to listen to the Word of God and to be nourished by, by Christ himself, the body of Christ, let us, just for a few moments now, just we acknowledge our sins. We do so with confidence in the forgiveness of God. And just a few moments now, just in, in silent prayer. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, 
and what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And let us pray. O God, Almighty Father, our faith professes that your Son died and rose again. Mercifully grant that through this mystery, your servant Chris, who has fallen asleep in Christ, may rejoice to rise again through him, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, for ever and ever. Amen. Would you like to be seated, please? I now invite uh, Margaret uh, to come forward, please, for the, for the first reading. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will prepare for all peoples a banquet of rich food. On this mountain, he will remove the morning veil that is covering all peoples and the shroud enwrapping all nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from every cheek he will take away his people's shame everywhere on earth, for the Lord has said so. That day it will be said, See, this is our God in whom we hoped for salvation. The Lord is the one in whom we hoped. We exult and we rejoice that he has saved us. This is the word of the Lord. With rod and with stone 
Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. On arriving at Bethany, Jesus found that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days already. Bethany is only about two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to sympathize with them over their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus had come, she went to meet him. Mary remained sitting in the house. Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatever you ask of God, he will grant you. Your brother, said Jesus to her, will rise again. Martha said, I know he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. If anyone believes in me, even though he dies, he will live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she said. I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God, the one who was to come into this world. The Gospel of the Lord. There's quite a selection of readings to choose from when preparations are being attended to for a funeral mass. And when we all met the other evening there, Colette and the the family, to begin to look at the arrangements for this mass, what was very clear was the reading 
that you wanted to, to have to be part of this liturgy. There was no hesitation, no being undecided, for you knew the reading that you wanted for Chrissy's Mass, for, for your dad's Mass. And the Isaiah reading, which we have just heard, which really is a, is a lovely reading, it's one which is most appropriate, the choice that, that has been made. And the not unfamiliar line on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will prepare for all peoples a feast. And I have to say, I love the words of the reading which has been chosen, which we have just listened to. God has brought us to the mountain. He's brought us to the mountain of the church. And the church is a feast. It's a feast. It's a feast of, of grace. And it is full of good things. It's full of hope, pardon, peace. It's full of life. And it is full of eternal life. Full of good things. And the greatest of all is the Mass. And it really is a a beautiful mountain from which we are called to feed. And for that reason, it is a very, very suitable choice of a reading which Colette and the family have made. For Chris, one of the things that Chris in life did enjoy was feeding from the feast of the church. The church was such a major part of his life Faith, faith was such a major part of his life, his faith in God. Right from an early age, he was, as you know, an Edinburgh boy. And right from an early age, his faith, which was such a major part of his life, and it was shown from an early age, just as Chris being a server, an altar server, in his home parish in Edinburgh but also right the way throughout his life, just ensuring that Mass, going to Mass, just coming to Mass was very much part of his life, very much part of the life of of his family. Chris and Colette, as a family, when the family were younger, going to Mass, coming to Mass, and then when they had all kind of flown the nest. Colette and Chris, just so attentive to their their duties in the vigil mass. And again, people tend to be creatures of habit. Everybody's got their own seat at church and nobody dares sit in your seat. And Chris and Colette's were that side of the church there, about three quarters of the way up. And let me say, no holiday, there was no holiday from the faith for Chris. There was no break from it, for it was something which was all year round, no holiday from it. And when the, when the Shevlins, and again if you think of it, when most folk who go on holiday, they would take a bucket and a spade, but the Shevlins, when they went on holiday, they took their own priest. It was part of the Shevlins holiday part of the Shevlins on tour, their own travelling priest. And it was a delight, actually, just, and there are so many lovely stories which have been shared and memories which have been shared. And it was a delight just listening to some who got to know the Shevlins on holiday and folks saying that they would be sitting there just sipping away at a Cuba Libre in the sunshine and then the family just next in the deck chairs, next getting to know them, and then part of the getting to know and the being introduced was being introduced to their very own priest. But seriously, faith and church, these were things which were very much a major part of of Chris's life. He was, and ensured that he was uh, just attentive to, to his duties. And I'm thinking as well, during the the time as well, when his health, when he was experiencing difficulties in his health, and whether it was at home or in the hospital, again, just the image that we 
have been invited just through Colette and our family's choice of reading the Isaiah reading of, of a feast from which we can feed. But again, during Chris's time of being unwell, he did. He was very much appreciative of being able to, well, he wasn't maybe to, able to come here, as was very much part of his life, just going to Mass. But whether it was at home or in the hospital, uh, through the services of, of the chaplain and of, of the parish, receiving Holy Communion, and also the times, and he was very appreciative of the times when he did receive the, the sacrament of, of anointing. As we gather in this sacred place of this parish church of St Andrew to bid farewell to Chris, to pray for him, to pray for his soul, for the peaceful repose of his soul, I want to e extend a, a word of uh, deepest sympathy to Chris's family as we come to commend him to God, to Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, but to Colette and to Laura and Paul and Nicola, and to your spouses, um, Ken and Sinead and Johnny, and to all the grandchildren, Claudia, Ruri, Dominic, Anya, Sean, Zara, and Tilly, and to, to Chris's brother, Pat, and to a whole host of relatives and friends and neighbours who are gathered here in such a, a large number. And not least, the Chevron supporters bus that's here this morning, the Springburn supporters bus. And I know just how appreciative Colette and the whole family are for the, effort that's, the efforts that have been made from, from many. I think it's almost a full bus of, of 50. And, and I think you've done very well. I think when most people here have been struggling to park a car and you've managed to park a bus, deepest and most, most prayerful sympathies to you all. And we are joined here, and again, all of us in such a, a large gathering, and I think it just shows how much Chris was held in high regard and how much he was admired, there being just a full church here this morning. But we are joined too with the many who are participating in this funeral mass online, just via the live stream, as friends and relatives, participating from many places, from Ireland, from Canada, from Australia, and from America. After the, the prayer, after communion, Paul will say a few words, just give a eulogy, and I'm sure expressing what his dad meant to his mum and to the whole family, to all who, who knew. Chris, and there will be sharing of some memories, I'm sure, just capturing something of his dad's, of, of Chris's personality, his passions, his interests, you know, not least his, his passion for football and his gift and his talent as a footballer and just such a fine footballer as you know he was and, and a lovely picture as well in the inside of the a lovely photograph in the inside of, of the order of, of service. But just that will be the eulogy just after the prayer, after, after Holy Communion. He was, Chris, was a true gentleman, and, it, and it's not surprising that, it's not surprising there's such large gathering here, but also all the, the likes and the clicks that the, the lovely online tribute to him has, has received. But just to go back to the, the lovely choice of, of a reading that has been made, the Isaiah reading, the Mass, this beautiful mountain from which we feed. At this Mass for, for Chris, we have heard God's Word, His Word, God's Word, just summoning us to trust, summoning us to trust in God, to have hope, to have hope in an eternal life, to have hope in the mystery of life after death. Without Christ, without Christ as our hope, without faith, which is gift, faith is gift. It was a gift which Chris in life and throughout his life appreciated 
and did treasure, attended to. But without such a gift, without the gift of faith, death not being the end is something which does sound absurd. To the unbeliever, to the unbeliever, it does sound nonsense. To the unbeliever, death does look like it has the last word. It does look like it has the final word. And again, this good thing of the Mass, which is part of, of the feast, the Word of God, summons us to trust, to trust in God, to have hope, to have hope in everlasting life, the everlasting joy of heaven for the believer, for the person of faith. That is, that is our hope. If we, if we didn't believe in such a mystery, the mystery of, of, of heaven, then what would be the point, what would be the use of, of praying for our departed loved ones? We pray for them, our departed loved ones, all those who have gone before us marked with a sign of faith because of our belief in death not being the end, because of our belief in heaven and the mystery of everlasting life. We pray for them, we pray for, for, for Chris, for him to be led to the fullness of eternal life, for him to be led to the enduring joys of heaven. We come praying for Colette and for Laura, Paul and Nicola and the whole family, that in this time of sorrow and sadness, in this time of grief, that they may be able to, to find comfort. And as I said at the beginning of the Mass, we pray for ourselves, for we are here in the presence of, of death and there's always that need to be asking God to increase our faith, reinforce our hope, reinforce our hope especially in the mystery of life after death. So with Colette and with Laura, Paul and Nicola and the whole family we pray eternal rest grant unto Chris, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. May he rest in peace. Amen. May his soul and the souls of all the faithful departed to the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. like to stand please. We now invite uh, Jackie to come forward please for the intercessions the bidding prayers. God the Almighty Father raised Christ his Son from the dead. With confidence we ask him to save all his people living and dead. The response is hear our prayer. For Chris, who in baptism was given the pledge of eternal life, that he now may be admitted to the company of all the saints. Lord, in your mercy. For the family and friends of Chris, that they may be consoled in their grief by the Lord, who wept at the death of his friend Lazarus. Lord, in your mercy. For Chris's deceased relatives and friends, especially his parents, his brother Michael, Colette's parents, along with Brian, Vicky and Tom Smith, that they may have the reward of their goodness. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We thank God for all the doctors and nurses who care for the sick, especially those working in the coronary care unit who looked after Chris with such outstanding dedication and compassion in his final days. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We humbly call on you, Lord God, our Heavenly Father, to hear these prayers which we offer for Chris and for all those who have gone before us marked with the sign of faith. Welcome them into that promised kingdom of light and peace, for we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'd like to be seated, please. And I think it's...
four of the grandchildren who are going to do the offer chair, if you'd just like to make your way to the, the back now, please, thanks. <coughs> We humbly present to you these sacrificial offerings, O Lord, for the salvation of your servant Chris. We beseech your mercy that he who did not doubt your son to be a loving saviour may find in him a merciful judge. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In him the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim.
you either sit or kneel, please, for this part of the Mass. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. And remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world. Bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, with William, our Bishop, with all the clergy, Remember your servant, Chris, whom you've called from this world to yourself. Grant that he who was united with your son in a death like his may also be one with him in his resurrection. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who've died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, blessed Joseph, her spouse, the blessed Apostles, Andrew, with all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to stand, please. <laughs> The Saviour's command and forum by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope in the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will who live and reign for ever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other the sign of peace.
the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord,
like to stand please and let us pray. <laughs> Lord God, whose Son left us in the sacrament of his body, food for the journey, mercifully grant that strengthened by it, our brother Chris may come to the eternal table of Christ. For we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to be seated please for the eulogy. Thank you, Father Mackel and Father Stephen, for this beautiful Mass. I'd also like to thank everyone here for joining us. Many have travelled overseas to celebrate the life of my dad and for the support you have given our family these last few weeks. We will forever be grateful. The great thing about today is that nearly all the things that mattered in my dad's life are present here in the church. Our God, in whom he had faith in till the very end. <clears throat> Our mum, Colette, the love of his life, his absolute soulmate and constant rock. His three children, and in particular, my sisters, Laura and Nicola, their husbands, Ken and Johnny, my wife, Sinead, and every one of his seven grandchildren, all of whom he loved to bits. And of course, his older brother, Patrick, and many friends from football, the, the licensed trade and life. Dad was born in Edinburgh on the 6th of May 1942. His parents, Barbara and Anthony, were from Mayo in Ireland. While they did not have much, they brought my dad up in a house full of love and laughter. As a kid, my dad found a passion for football spending his days in the meadows playing football with other boys, sharing the same dream of becoming a professional. One of these boys never fulfilled his dreams and ended up delivering milk. My dad always felt sorry for Sean Connery for not making the big time. <laughs> dad attended St Peter's Primary where he played in the school team and met his lifelong friend Gus McLeod. We're so pleased you're here today, Gus. His family watched every game, week, every game each week standing in the same spot beside the goals. This position came in very handy one Saturday when my grandmother got a great assist by using her handbag to reroute the ball into the back of the net. <laughs> the goal was given much to my dad's embarrassment. <laughs> Weeks later, his brother Pat decided to get himself involved in a cup game quickly running on from the sidelines and scoring yet another goal on behalf of my dad. <laughs> that goal was also given. Dad was totally mortified. Dad went to St Anthony's secondary school and his football career was now taking priority over his academic pursuits. He was picked as a schoolboy internationalist and in 1959 had signed a provisional contract with Hearts FC. While still an apprentice bookbinder, he was farmed out to Lonehead Mayflower, 
and then spent a period in the reserves operating in both full-back positions. Dad made his first team appearance on the 2nd of April 1963, and in the season 63-64, Hearts fielded one of the best defensive partnerships in Scotland, with Jim Cruikshank, Chris Shevlin and Davy Holt in defence. He made 162 club appearances and was club captain in season 64-65. He got four under 23 caps and represented the Scottish League 11. Amazingly, Liverpool had several attempts to sign him from Hearts, offering over 35,000. But because he was the breadwinner, under his mum's orders, he stayed at home with his £3 a win and one fifty a draw bonus. <laughs> Early in 1967, Dad suffered a bad injury and Hearts let him go. However, as they say, when one door closes, another one opens. Jock Steen signed him for Celtic in June 1967, and even though he was only there for a season, that call changed his life forever. He was at a cup game at Hamden, and Jimmy Steele introduced him to a very young Colette Smith. And I mean very young. <laughs> she was only 17, Dad was 25. Steely informed young Colette that Chris was on the lookout for a wife. <laughs> Personally, I think they could have played it a bit cooler. <laughs> a few days later, they bumped into each other again outside Celtic Park, and my dad asked young Colette out on a date. He really pushed the boat out to woe young Colette. She had an extravagant, extravagant all-expenses night out at the Celtic Supporters Club in Bowness. <laughs> <coughs> Colette's father, John Smith, got wind of the budding relationship and was very wary of Chris and his intention towards his very young daughter. So he travelled to Celtic Park to speak to Sean Fallon, Celtic assistant manager who, who he knew well. Sean told him, you have nothing to worry about there, John. He's a lovely boy. Funny how things work out. 35 years, years later, I was asking Sean to marry his daughter, Sinead. <laughs> Fortunately, Sean thought I was a lovely boy too. <laughs> Things started to look up for my dad when he signed for Hibs in 1968, with 91 appearances and the Player of the Year in 1970. It was at Hibs he would meet his great friend, Willie Hunter. That year, he married her mum, Colette, in St Mungo's Church in Townhead. They set up home in Bishop Briggs, and Dad had a short spell at Morton. During this time, my sister Laura was born. He hung up his boots on his football career in 1974 and moved from football to the licence trade, working initially under the watchful eye of Bill Martin at the Calypso Bar in Kelvin Grove. He then took on the lease of the Terminus Bar in Springburn from 1976 to 79 before moving back to the West End at the 3-1 in Woodlands Road for a short spell. But his heart was in Springburn, and in 1980 he bought the Victoria Bar and renamed it Chevlins. His amazing legacy remains with the family to this day. It speaks volumes for his reputation and the respect in which he is held that so many of his customers and former colleagues are with us today. The family are all incredibly grateful. Dad was hard-working and built up a great business in Springburn. He loved to chat to all his customers and took a genuine interest in their lives and well-being. Although, let's be honest, he did not take any nonsense for anybody in the pub. I was born in 1975 to complete a gentleman's family. We had a great life. Fantastic holidays, wonderful day trips, and overall, for Laura and I, an idyllic childhood. Then, Nicola arrived. <laughs> Life as we knew it changed considerably, and with Nicola around, there was never a dull moment. My dad's blood pressure soared as he gave her the affection, the nickname of Heed the Ball. For those of you who knew my dad, he was always very punctual, did not like anyone to be late, and was quite easily wound up. His temperament could on occasion be rather fiery, often associated, associated with a choice of English not best suited for St Andrew's Church. <clears throat> when Laura got married, 
she was in traditional style late for the mass. On arrival at the church, Dad bolted from the bridal car, slamming the door in Laura's face, running up the church stairs. <laughs> the photographer had to tell him to go back and collect the bride. One or two words may have been said as well. On another occasion in the pub in Springburn, he was waiting from 7.30am for a delivery of 30 kegs scheduled at 8am. By 11.30, with the pub nearly full, the delivery still had not arrived. At 12.15, the delivery driver bounded in the door and told my dad that he only had one keg of beer for him. You can only imagine the face, temper and language from my dad. He was using words usually associated with the Bible. Little did he know that Big James, the, del the delivery driver, had 30 kegs in the lorry, but knew that my dad was a perfect target. <laughs> like many natural sportsmen, dad took an interest in a few other sports and was a member at Codder Golf Club for a number of years. He was also a fantastic table, table tennis player, badminton player, and took a real interest in the oval-shaped ball when I started playing. Dad, of course, after a brilliant second career, eventually retired from the licensed trade, and we are so grateful that he and Mum travelled the world and went on some amazing holidays. The emails would roll in, signed love from C&C. We all thought it was Charles and Camilla telling us about their latest cruise. Then we realised it was Chris and Colette. When Nicola would come back from Dubai and Mum and Dad would pick them up from the airport, my dad was always asking when they were going back. That's the way he was. Dad always made himself at home and he loved going round the corner to Laura and Ken's house. He would oft, often pay a visit to the grandkids and then go for a kip on their couch. The last few years have been challenging for us, all, for us all. Two years ago, when things got really difficult, we thought we were going to lose him. But as strong as an ox, he bounced back. Leaving hospital, he set himself three goals. A trip to his beloved beloved Kelly's Hotel in Wexford, a stay in Gerald and Carol's flat in Estepona, and a holiday in Dubai to see Nicola, Johnny, Zara and Tilly. He managed all three and most poignantly got the whole family back together in Tunbury the Christmas before last. He and mum had some great quality time together, mainly sipping coffee and gossiping with friends in Dele Zeke in the West End. <coughs> The family would like to thank the coronary care team at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital who looked after Dad with such love and compassion. We would also like to thank Jackie Templeton, who, as well as being my mum's friend, also became my dad's personal nurse. nurse. Sorry, Jackie. <coughs> mum, on behalf of Laura, Nicola and I, we would like to thank you for the care, love and devotion to our dad throughout his life. You were at his side till the very end showered him in a blanket of love and were an incredible comfort as he made his final journey. <coughs> to Laura, Nicola and myself, he was not a football star or a publican. He was just our dad. He worked tirelessly to give us a better life than his own and was always there giving advice, support and love. Our hearts are broken. <coughs> we will miss him more than words can ever say. Dad loved his old Irish tunes and was very fond of Phil Coulter. To end and say farewell to a wonderful dad, some words from his song, The Old Man. <clears throat> he was more than just my father, my teacher, my best friend, and he will still be heard in the tunes we shared when I play them on my own. And I never will forget him, for he made me what I am. Though he may be gone, Memories linger on, and I miss him, the old man. Thank you, Dad. We love you. May God bless you and keep you safe in his arms. Stand, please.
trusting in God, we have prayed together for Chris, and now we come to the last farewell. There is sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we shall see Chris again and enjoy his love and his friendship. And although this congregation will disperse in sorrow, the mercy of God will gather us together again in the joy of his kingdom. Therefore, let us console one another with our faith and hope in the person and the mystery of Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Once again, the holy water is sprinkled, a reminder to us of the waters of baptism, baptism which for the Christian is the beginning of an eternal union, an eternal life with God, and the incense in our liturgy symbolises our, our prayers, just as it, the incense rises, so too do our prayers. Prayers that we are offering in this Mass, and the prayers that we're called to offer in the time ahead, praying for Chris and for the peaceful repose of his soul. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother Chris in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you gave to Chris in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of heaven to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our brother forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Chris, may the angels lead you into paradise. May the martyrs come to welcome you and take you to the holy city, the new and eternal Jerusalem. <laughs> 